A very good evening, friends. I take great pleasure in introducing Shibu Kocheri and the very eminent Mr. Ashok Vishwanathan to you. They will be in conversation on Shibu's book, Faith and the Beloved. Let me uh, first introduce Ashok Vishwanathan who is a national and international award-winning filmmaker, who is currently professor and dean at the Satyajit Ray Film and Television Institute, Kolkata. He has directed more than 150 film projects, including feature films, documentaries, short films, and television shows. Apart from the national awards, Ashok Vishwanathan had five Indian panorama entries at the IFFI, is a Charles Wallace Scholar at Cambridge, and has won the Dishari BFGA Kalakar and the JU's Awards, besides the Silver Torchlight Award at Yong Yang. He has been a visiting professor at Tufts University, Boston, and Monmouth University, New Jersey. Thank you so much, uh, Ashok Vishwanathan, for being with us today. We are really, really excited and happy to have you and looking forward to you being in conversation with the author. Thank uh, you. Shibu, yes. Uh, Shibu Kochiri, he's a best-selling and award-winning author of Men and Dreams in the Dhaulathar in the Dhaladar, graduated from the prestigious National Defense Academy, Khadak Wasya in 1981. He has served in the Indian Navy and commanded two warships. Post his retirement, he has executed hydroelectric projects in the Kaveri River Basin in Karnataka, Vyas River Basin in Himachal, and Tista River Basin in Sikkim. He holds a postgraduate degree in Defense Studies from Chennai University and an MA in English Literature from Pune University. Shibu has changed tack from the snow-clad mountains to the blue oceans and has been associated with the setting up of a shipping company in India. Faith and the Beloved is his second book. Many of the characters in the novel are inspired from those whom he has encountered, encountered during his extensive travel. Kochiri Shibu was born in Kochi, Kangarapadi, and now lives in Bangalore with his wife and daughter. Thank you, Shibu, for uh, agreeing to do this interview. We look forward with a lot of enthusiasm. And I now hand over to Ashok Vishwanathan to take the discussion forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Mona. Thank you very much, Mona, for that very kind introduction to both of us. But uh, I personally feel that Shibu deserves every bit of it. As I was telling him, I'm fascinated by this novel, Faith and the Beloved. Uh, my apologies, I've not read the first novel, but I've read this one in detail. And it struck me from the very first moment that it was an intriguing piece of writing. It was something that gripped you, but also intrigued you, where you had lots of questions. And the way he has actually structured the narrative, that is very, very interesting. It is by no means a linear, straight narrative. The narrative, you know, interpolates and extrapolates and you go back and forth. And my first question to Shibu, after congratulating him for his endeavor, is was it very deliberate on your part to create this kind of a narrative discourse? Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, thank you for the uh, kind words. Of course, uh, the uh, you know, yes, the narrative in uh, terms of differing timelines and differing events uh, in a not a linear narration, yes, it is by design. But also at the same time that, you know, as I said, uh, in all my writing, I start off with uh, a lot of effort and, and research into character sketching. 
and i believe the character should come live and so a lot of it was uh, done as the novel was uh, written that means as you went along so there were you know the stories running in parallel and as it happens in life that the uh, events need not be linear in many cases whenever you know you know the lives of two people or more than two people when they cross each other the crossing point may be one but events before and after then as in real life they will be uh, spread out in time and space so i have taken that kind of approach to in writing this it comes with its own challenges it's uh, it's quite tough in writing also that part i accept so in fact therefore your novel is designed but it is also spontaneous there are things which you have done as you are writing and one of the things that you have done which i find very marvelous is that there are many gray characters you know the characters are not solid in the sense that they are black and white which is which is what makes it very real i would compare it with say an arvind adiga you know the kind of writing that he does uh, i like the character of prem very much you know it's a character which is not a negative character i would not call it a negative character but lots of shades of gray in the character could you tell us a little bit about prem so uh, you know it's like uh, you know when you write any of these novels when i i always believe in taking what i call slice of a society into the background of the all the writing and uh, i am a fan of history and i believe that one of the uh, you know problems of many of the readers and including me is that you know we always look at history from an individual prism or a prism that is given to you by the media or by the newspapers or by the powers b at that point in time and there is a lot of uh, skewing which takes place so it takes a discerning reader to go back and look at events which happened dispassionately with the discerning mind and then try to correlate so if you see the book starts off with an event in the 1930s where you know that was a time when uh, in our own uh, dr ambedkar had fallen out with uh, gandhi ji for some time for the way they are uh, you know the The, the what he called the dalits were not treated well or they were not being included so there was a strike and there was a period in time when there was a, what is called a janevu andolan which took place in that hindi heartland so these are events and uh, there was you know that struggle of people to break out of the morass of getting tied down in the way they were tied down in the society and trying to get out of it so even start to somebody who is breaking barriers doing something of course crossing the line not not an accepted norm in any society but he has done it so when that gets carried forward even after let's say a generation or two generations there is no forgiving in our system that means uh, that system is so uh, so rigid that even after maybe 30 years 60 years it comes back and to haunt them so now this is a reality in our you know in our uh, the hindi heartland where the caste and the caste equations have always been a bane for us and it continues to be even today because even today when you i mean like you since you mentioned arvind dadiga he also highlights that one issue in very very uh, you know very uh, let's say maybe slightly overstepping the line but okay you highlighted the issue so what that the, the character that prem represents that segment of the society even when someone let's say uh, comes out he tries to be you know better than what he is the society does not allow him so there are shades of gray and then you are trying to fight for what you think is right or in your own perception of how things should be so that is how i said you know i like to call that you know more of a slice of life as a society is without being judgmental on what is right, right. right or wrong i appreciate what you have said about uh, your reading of history so like you have spent a lot of time in designing the characters going into detail and also going into the history the second very thing that strikes you right between the eyes is the milieu you know you have brought out the milieu brilliantly if you permit let me just read a few lines from the chapter on naiti which is very important and um, which i find it's almost visual you know it's like a painting <clears throat> naiti was born in 1971 to the landed gentry in the village of oriyankara on the outskirts of kochi she was named after her grandmother 
who died young. She was the fourth child and the only girl child in the Cheroril family. The Cheroril family owned large tracts of land and tea and rubber estates and were well placed in society. Her father, Jacob Cheroril, was the traditional Syrian Christian father who believed in the Lord and did not believe in sparing the rod. The church was an essential part of her childhood life. Her upbringing was strict and Syrian Christian by nature. She went to St. Peter's School, the family-run local English medium school. The morning prayer with the family was a must before leaving for school. So was the prayer before dinner. The family followed fasting and feasting as per their Syrian Christian church. After her primary education, she followed her brothers to join the famous St. Lawrence School at Lovedale in Uti. It took her three months to adjust to the hostile life and fall in love with school. She hated school vacations during summer and winter and dreaded the church-driven life at home. She categorized vacations into lots. The summer vacation was the wedding time. Starting from the Sunday after Easter, there was a flurry of weddings of near and distant families. Weddings were also silk dress events, where every woman and girl had to be clad in a silk dress or a silk sari. Women formed the never-ending gossip groups, and men formed the shop talk group. Baptisms formed the next group. All the cousins and country cousins who got married produced children, and in every vacation, there were the baptisms to be attended to. There were the occasional funerals of the dead and the departed too. But that's just the beginning of the chapter on Maithya. I think it's very brilliantly written, and it shows your uh, extreme knowledge, almost like the back of your palm, of that society. Could you tell us how you are able to write in such detail? That, of course, is, uh, you know, I am from Kerala. I am a Syrian Christian. So this Syrian Christian life in Kerala, it's been part of me. And, you know, it's you get I've seen a lot of it. So though, of course, this is not an autobiographical uh, representation, but it is a slice of life from the traditional Syrian Christians of the, let's say, the Things have changed quite a bit in the century, but the 70s, 80s was traditionally, yes, that was a large part of the society was like that. So a lot of the things that is written there is, uh, let's say, in, uh, in, 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 it relates quite well to what happens in the Sri Christian families and in Christian traditions, the Sri Christian way of life. And some of it was by design because one of the things I believe in that when I write, uh, and even if it's a fiction novel, that a reader who reads as much as he uh, reads a fiction must also get some value addition, uh, a perspective on the background and the people and, you know, something more than what is really, really available in the open literature. So many of the uh, stuff written in this book will not be easily available to a reader, even on the, you know, let's say in open literature. Not easily available, not that it's not available, not easily available. So one of the aims was also to bring out this aspect of life which to many readers like you found it fascinating. Many others have also told me this, that, that you know, there was, yes, this aspect of life, which, okay, the people who are in it take it for granted, but as a reader, yes, at times it's like entering another world. And that was by design. And, you know, that is what aids the narrative, you know, a narrative which has uh, got a lot of excitement, which is very much action-driven. It also has so much of milieu and sidegeist and background and research that makes you makes you want to wait for those parts when they come, you know. And both the parts, the ones which are really action-packed and the ones which are, you know, probing, which are trying to be more philosophical, more metaphysical, they are equally attractive. So I think it's a very good blend that you've achieved in this particular novel. And the end, which I will not, of course, reveal, but even in the end, you end with a kind of a, you know, mellow tone, because in the middle, there's a lot of red hot stuff happening, but it ends with a, a kind of a mellow tone. Did you uh, decide on the entire story uh, at the beginning itself, or did it, as it progressed, uh, achieve the form that it did? 
so the uh, if you see the blueprint of the story is there in the first chapter because the first chapter kind of lays the clues to all that which is discussed a number of times there are two three uh, people who are reviewing the events which take place in the first chapter or two and to interpret it to make sense out of it so almost every word every sentence has got a clue in it which is for the mystery and thrill part of it so the second part of it is that i, I also believe that you know that uh, in any of the storytelling and story writing uh it need not necessarily be like i keep telling with many of the people say that you know in hindi movies the difference between a hero and a villain is that hero has a past which justifies the present and villain does not act so you do not know why he is the way he is so the audience always relates to the hero whichever way is presented because there is a justifiable relation from background from his past to the present so in my writing i always whether it's five characters or eight characters i try to give the shades of background for everyone so whether it's a hero or a villain there is a past to him and there is a present and it's for the reader to decide whether you think is you know you know it's right or wrong or whatever you want to see or being judgmental so the second aspect of it is that you know the uh, not everything need not finish off as i say that uh, when when crime is always when a line is crossed in the society or in somebody's life nobody plans to be a criminal or nobody plans a crime act criminal activity but there are times in life when you have left with no options but to cross the line because that is the only option that you have at that point in time to save what over you stand for value for and there are times when you have to fight for what you stand for so a lot of the times you know the relationship bonding between women and uh, your approach to life does get philosophized the way you have been brought up and what you your value systems are so the end is also by design the last chapter of course is by design to keep it a little bit of philosophical in its approach and not just to life it's for the readers to read in between and decipher so the while the blueprint was there in the first chapter yes the to this novel as i wrote as characters came in and as events developed because i spent uh, a lot of time was for almost one and a half years went in researching of characters background stories putting the material together so when you as you start writing and picking the characters and you know weaving it through there have been changes which happened as it, as you start writing so you have a blueprint but of course it has taken a number of iteration then of course when you go to the editor there is one final uh, what do you call that one word batsman fire as i call it where the editor takes you to the task and there's one final round which comes out so yes initially the there was a kind of now broad broad outline in mind which is there the first chapter but a lot of it is uh, you know there is twists and turns have been as the writing took place as the characters developed and as even developed and uh, as you said that uh, you know if i were to use some film parlance uh, it is both documentary and fiction because you have introduced certain very real events like uh, the incident at the taj mahal hotel the terrorist strike you know uh, the ltte tract now these uh, needed to have been researched i suppose uh, what what was your approach to including such events uh, one of the things that i believe in is you know that as i said since this book is primarily targeted indian audience and a uh, lot of the you know young readers when i speak to them most of them you know some of them say ltt they have you know they always sound surprised he was there an organization like that so you know it is uh, many of the what as i said you know one of the efforts was to uh, bring in the contemporary events in the recent history of india how it has affected us and it is important for readers to understand when things go wrong in a society you cannot forget it and move forward we must know what went wrong what happened to what level people went so it is that what which makes us wiser as we move forward in understanding and moving forward so the ltt was till date i consider the fiercest terror organization that ever existed i mean i don't think anybody has matched the levels to which they have got and i don't think anybody will to motivating the people and bringing in the concept of suicide the terrorism and telling people that you know because it throws us under a complete legal system because your complete legal system is based on a premise that a man values he or she values his life now if you tell someone that you know killing yourself is the best thing to do then where is the legal system that you can do to him so the way we have structured a society 
and way we have structured the legal system. So when you come into this limiting line, it becomes very difficult. So LTT pushed it outside the limits of anything that you can do. What can you do to man when they decided that the value in life is in killing yourself for a cause? And they could convince people to that you know that it is better to die as a hero, Vira Maranam, as you used to call it, as uh, the the chief from convince people, and so many of them. So even today, what others have followed after that, what you know, the other terror organizations taken, it's only a shade of what he has achieved. Nobody could really motivate people to the level which that organization could, and you know where people heroically went into this this kind of stuff. So I deliberately wanted to LTT. Everything was not good about them, and there's so many things that they did which are sinister. And uh, and uh, they were just to interrupt, sorry to interrupt. As you were saying just before we started this live broadcast, you had uh, personal experience also. Being in the naval forces at the time, could you just also talk a little bit about your personal experience? So, to the extent that you know that uh, I said, you know that uh, we had visited Colombo just before this, you know, the the problem started in 1982 when things were quite normal there. So we had seen one set immediately after that the or four started. And as part of my naval career, we were part of it, you know, vessels which patrolled. There was a point in time when they were patrolling. Uh, between india and sri lanka to keep you know the, the people at bay so and uh, the ipkf operations happened when we were serving and you know a whole lot of my colleagues who were involved in that by which of being in in, in a graduate from india a lot of my peer group from the army air force people and also the events which took place there were kind of day to day communication or you know worry for all of us at that point in that how we landed up in this kind of mess from all sides So a lot of the events were you no, know, you know, but of course it at some point it went beyond control and when events went out. So we, to that extent, yes, even LTT and events which happened in and around Sri Lanka, a lot of it was part of our career life. So to that extent, yes, I was quite familiar with that part of it. And uh, even with not with standing, all the research we went into actually finding out when someone actually travels to war torn Sri Lanka, what happens. Just when that war has come to an end, so that's how that you know character starts. And even that event which is quoted, it's an actually that I remember that event when it took place sometime in the 80s, where there was an incident, I think 86 or 87. There was a, an actual event of a family being murdered by a mob in Colombo, and the father comes out of the car, burning car, and the children were not uh, you know set fire. So he takes the children and decides that. children will die with him than being left to the mob so that kind of had stayed with me for quite some time this particular event that you know plight of a father where he has to you know kill his two two child girls with him and then then uh, you know opt to leave them with the mob what was outside so the one of the characters is developed from there where of course that boy is not there in that story that boy is brought in here where in who is to leave to fight another day and then that he is living for a cause even the cause is over he is still living for it as it happens in many of these cases so that that part yes yeah, so i just by design i said you know our, our people should know that you know it is uh, the we had a large issue which which had for more three decades it was it had, you know permeated into every level of our society which had uh, you know with the pluses and the minuses so you have both a, <clears throat> a micro level at the crime Uh, the, 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 as a crime story, there's a micro level and a macro level because you have included something like LTT, which has a huge history, philosophy, uh, you know, and as you're saying, it's one of the most uh, ferocious, if you may call it that, organizations of all time. Because for them, even uh, you know, sacrificing one's life is not at a premium. You know, they can do it. So that is something which is very interesting, and. Uh, in the process you have created some very very believable characters you know the, the reason why I, i said earlier also why this book is so uh, dear to me is one because it is with an international flavor relating totally to indian or you know asian events and secondly uh, it actually creates characters which are very believable you know if you look at the character of uh, naidi cheroril uh, you know she seems absolutely a real character and you know the way you brought in the iit you know the 
competition there. And these are places where I've been to. And the IIM after that. Uh, was she modeled on any real character in your experience? <laughs> Uh, no, it is not a lift off from a, a person whom I know. Definitely not. But uh, you know, and as I said, you know, a lot of these things are. You know, I do. I have met a lot of. I have a lot of friends from IIT and IIMs, and uh, pretty familiar with you know what, uh, how things happen there, and you know. So to that extent, it is a you know the there is no one particular individual on which she is based. But the idea was to bring out because I have come across you know. After the liberalisation of the economy and the curtsy the IT sector, uh, it has been a you know, many times that true talent of women who are capable of, let's say, uh, understanding business better than men, which is something which many men find it difficult to digest. That, but as you uh, you know, the traditional businesses where you are standalone and running a business was okay, but as you are after liberalisation took place and as the economy grew. And if you did not know the sector, if you did not know how to study the sector, and to see the trends, that you know the consolidation which takes place, a lot of the things go out of the ambit of the traditional family-run businesses, unless they really keep the wits about them. And there have been actual cases where you know it is uh, the IIT, IIM have thrown out really some talented women who have understood the business very well. So this is also to highlight that point, to that you know the traditional houses. Many of them, even today, even in this 21st century, they still believe that, you know, the business decisions is kind of still a, uh, the male hierarchy. But I, you know, that is also by deliberately to bring out as to finally it is not so much about man or woman. Yeah, it is about understanding the business. Because a woman who understands it for you, she is the one who will bring in the sales. So that is the deliberately to highlight that one aspect. And there are many like her, may not be large enough in number, but there are. Successful, uh, let's say, IIT IIM graduates who made a mark for them, and uh, proven that you know they can, you know, develop business and do things. So there are many such stories which are there, which are known in the open media also today. Many people have talked about. So of course that character was built to reflect that one aspect of India. And uh, where do you think Alice will go from here? You know, you've given a hint uh, that she will go into academics. Uh, what is your? What do you think? What will happen to Alice? I have not actually. I have not thought. I have not really. I have not uh, put anything beyond what is written there. So it is like this. You know, normally it is one of the. Uh, this what was also an effort to tell the young people also that even in today's society, uh, if you keep your wits about you in any any situation, and if you are able to, finally it's all about thinking and your ability to think. And without losing your wits, that will keep you alive in any environment. That has always been the the as a fact of life, whether it is 21st century, 20th century, or go back to AC, BC times, go back to Chanakya's time. Story is the same. It's like people say that you know it's always it is the mind which has to win first. Then only events will unfold. I mean, because in the military there's a saying, you know, we say that battles are fought and won in the minds of people. So it is the mind which matters, and that is what people should group. And right. you know, drawn as and, uh, relevance. It, the relevance is a very, very, very key word here because I find a very interesting postmodern aspect in your novel. You know, in the very first scene involving Alice, you know, she's in a tremendous trouble, and it's almost like a computer game where she's trapped and she has to escape from that. So you have that feel, that frenetic feel of. Computer games also, in a very subtle metaphoric way, which is you know uh, touching your novel. Was that uh, thought of, or it came naturally? Because that's the world which the children of today are dealing with, the world of computer games. Yes, that is that's also by design also, and has also kind of thrown in a caution in that. If you see that you know the uh, as the evil elements are into every aspect, including games. So if you see that you know there have been uh, you know many of the incidents I brought out as to how the in that also there's a case wherein your the computer hackers get in and you to get to the the controllers to control the games to manipulate and get into a game and thereafter steal the identity or you know play play with the children which are playing the game. So the right. uh, basic norms of safety security as much as it is in you know, real life. It is equally applicable in computer games which they are playing, 
So that was deliberately a game because a lot of the children get into it. And there also there's a lot of uh, battle of wits which happens. You have to expand on it to make sure that you know, you're not losing out on your identity. Nobody's stealing your identity. So that aspect has been brought in. And with a deliberate aim to caution the, the you know, passionate computer gamers that not everything about that domain is also hunky dory. There could be trouble there also. And people come. Right. Out. Right. Uh, one other aspect which might have been intriguing to some, people might be even shocked by it, that there's a lot of open, blatant uh, uh, sexual references in the entire novel. One in terms of the language and two in uh, terms of explicit uh, sexual you know, scenes. Uh, what is the main reason for you to uh, introduce this in the manner that you have? So there is actually uh, one of the aspects that, you know, uh, which has come about is, you know, like uh, if you see the basics of the whole story takes off on a very uh, one pleasant uh, topic with many of the readers. And many of the readers specifically, I'm telling that many of the readers who are what I call drawing room readers or, you know, WhatsApp readers who Horizon is normally within the drawing room and do not have much exposure to society. So they do find it very unpleasant that, you know, even some of the readers have told me also that, you know, you are... Uh, you have not handled the subject of rape, uh, let's say, sensitively enough, which is the start point from where that you know trouble start and you know it's a someone rapes and then the lady decides there's no law, shoot him and kill him. So one of the corollary that you know, of course you know I, I just to bring about a little bit of history again, you know during the beginning of the 20th century, the Maharaja of Patiala is one of his uncles, one Mr. Khadak Singh. So he wanted to be a judge, mm. and the, you know the the Maharaja requested the British that you know my uncle should be the judge here. So Britishers told him, you know, you do not know the law, you do not know the regulations. What is your qualification? So he asked them that what is it that you want? So they said that we want that uh, law and order should be maintained, that in the law is enforced correctly. He said I will do that. He said leave that to me. That is what we have been doing all as well. I'll continue to do that. So he became a judge and. Uh, the first so the murder case that came to him was a uh, one woman whose husband was murdered and there were four accused. And uh, the woman said that, you know, these people beat us, beat her husband to death in the farm in front of her eyes. And the men refused. And there was a lawyer who was representing these four. So Khadak Singh uh, said, okay, so these are the four accused. They said, okay. So who are you as a lawyer? He said, I'm their lawyer. Why are you representing them? He said, so that means you're also party to their crime. He said, no, I'm a lawyer. No, it doesn't matter. So they said, decreed, hang all five of them. So his judgment came to an end there. And all five were, you know, uh, put to the gallows. After that, for that duration, next eight years when he was there, there was no question of any murder anywhere in that area. Now, the concept of justice and concept of uh, execution of justice is runs from society to society. And the way we have done it is, our society in this matter has been very, very brutal. That's only language of people understand. So that means his case is very clear cut cases. You have now there's nothing to discuss about. You make an, uh, you know, that this is how the law is going to be dealt. People fall in line. So now this is one aspect which, let's say, now this is one of our, let's say, weaknesses in our, the whole, uh, this, let's say, you go by the penal code, punishable by seven years. Okay, that is, how does it matter? Someone, Let's say that in, in India, when you say that poverty and honesty is difficult for it to coexist. Difficult, not that it cannot, but most of the time it's difficult. So someone has got nothing to lose seven years in life, he doesn't care. So <clears throat> we have adopted a legal system which is British by nature, and they had their own way of bringing it up. So in its implementation in India and its system that we follow, it has got its own limitations. So that was the let's say the aim to highlight one of those issues and second of course was also to bring about because when you talk about the subject and there is a certain amount of let's say the uh, uh, exploitation related aspects which happens in this particular case uh, you have talked about a guy who is working for a cause now he doesn't know he has been asked to do something he's doing it so whether it is right or wrong he doesn't care he's that the LTD man still thinks that LTD is working for LTD. He does not know the organization is gone. So, a lot of it has been contextual, 
with respect to writing of the novel and not with any other intent excepting for this one aspect which was to be highlighted so i have left it to the readers to be judgmental about it there are some people who have told you also that it is you know it is uh, let's say what is the word uh, overtly uh, let's say explicit some of the readers have said have they also some said people... has anyone uh, reacted uh, shibu uh, you know when uh, in that rape scene or love making scene whatever you call it that it was a bit patriarchal you know the patriarchal aspect came out because uh, you're saying that the woman will enjoy it eventually yeah so that is that's what i said you know that is the that is what the whole thing that mean if you read the whole thing that whole read book in its entirety it will not fall that perspective but of course if you select that one paragraph and say that that is the perspective of a man who has got an agenda behind that's the history behind is why he is like that there is a background and history to it which will come out later but if someone reads only that one chapter and says starts forming judgment about it then of course yes if you read it in isolation it will come out like that right but right. i expect that you know people read the book should read the book in its entirety uh and then correlate and then you know, to see whether the character is right or wrong then i like yes. i said i have tried not to be judgmental in it and all the characters in this book have got shades of gray yeah and apart from the gray you've also been very realistic you know people react in different ways and that's what is important and that is what is happening it is it would be foolhardy to say that these impulses are not there in us you know it is always there and we if we sweep it under the carpet that wouldn't be the right thing so in that sense i think that uh, there is a point in your favor now uh, i think we are nearing the end of the time and uh, before i conclude i would request you to read a portion of your novel which you think might be very interesting for us we don't have much time a little bit if you could please read us something any place sure okay i'll see say uh, tony disusa was 3 years old when he lost his parents his father chokalingam acharya was a businessman who ran a jewelry shop in the city and they stayed in uh, watala in the suburbs of colombo city his mother luda was polish and had been backpacking in sri lanka when she met chokalingam there was a world in romance and a courtship that followed they were married in 1974 they had three children in quick succession two girls and a boy the girls had gone on their father and the son kanan had gone on his mother in the 80s sri lanka was in the throes of a struggle between the tamils and the sinhalese the tamils had taken up arms against the sinhala government in the northern part of sri lanka the family did not think the troubles in the north of the country would ever affect them on the 25th of july 1983 the family was on the way back home when a frenzy sinhala mob attacked them they locked their parents in the car and pulled kanan and his two sisters out the car was set on fire and the mob was laughing when his father came out of the car engulfed in flames grabbed his sisters and ran back to the car and locked them in amidst the laughter of the sinhalese he heard his father's voice shouting to him kanna maternal poratwada now this i just said you know because this is an event which has stayed with me I, ever since that event first time i read it even so many decades down the line it always comes live in front of me as of the plight of a father who has to kill his own young children with him for no fault of theirs or fault of his no it's it's absolutely moving and not just this passage that you've read your novel is a path breaking novel i have no hesitation in saying that from my experience of cinema and uh, literature it is an indian novel definitely international in its ambit in its scope and its aspirations it is extremely interesting intriguing and it has also created a new style the way you use quotes quotations pithy sayings you know maxims which pepper your text the style is extremely novel in the true sense of the word and it is something that stays with you it's something intriguing 
and interesting. Congratulations to you. Please keep writing. And this is really the stuff that dreams are made of. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ashok. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for this very, very interesting, enlightening, and riveting discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Ashok Vishwanathan, for giving us the time, the scope, and the opportunity. You are wonderful. And Shibu, of course, we are great fans of yours. We love your writing. We love the way you speak. We enjoyed the session. And I would uh, request viewers, if you, you, we will put up the Amazon link. If you could kindly buy the book uh, right. you, online, it would really, really, really uh, be nice. You'll, as readers, you'll enjoy Faith and the Beloved. And uh, thank you so much. And Ashok Vishwanathan, I look forward to more such sessions. And Shivu, uh, Mr. Vishwanathan has already wished you that we are looking forward to your next book. Thank you so much on behalf of Readers and Writers Club. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so much, you. Thank you so much, Vishwanathan. Thank you. Thank you.